Okay, so welcome to section 2.2 where we're going to take a look at normal distributions and the density curve. We briefly mentioned the density curve in the last section, but we're going to take a little bit more of an in-depth look at that. Uh, this is going to be broken down into three recordings. The first one will be uh, basically taking a look at general normal distributions. The second one will be um, taking a look at the empirical rule and a little bit more in depth with that. In the third portion, we'll be taking a look at how to prove whether or not a distribution is approximately normally distributed. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Like I said, in this section, we're just going to uh, quickly take a look at describing the normal distribution and um, different characteristics of the normal distribution. So in chapter one, we took a look at a bunch of graphical and numerical summaries for describing distributions. We're going to add one more step to our strategy when taking a look at distributions. So remember when we are analyzing data, just showing numbers doesn't show a full picture and just showing a graph doesn't show a full picture of the data. We want to get both a graph and the numerical summaries. So when we take a look at quantitative data, which is what we're going to use throughout the rest of the course. Uh, remember that that's data that you can do math with. Find the average, add, subtract, multiply, divide, whatever. You always want to plot your data because this gives you an idea of where your lowest value is, where your highest value is, where's your values clustered around, where would your potential outliers be. So that graph really gives a good visual representation and that's really especially important for people that aren't mathy people. They can look at a graph and understand it. We're always going to look for overall patterns. What's the shape of the graph? Is it skewed right, skewed left, approximately normally distributed, symmetrical? Where's the center? Um, and remember, we're going to have to make decisions about the mean versus the median. And what is the spread? What's the standard deviation? What's the IQR? And we're going to look for anything that's sort of outside the ordinary, such as outliers. And just remember, when you take a look at outliers, um, you kind of want to be thinking about why that's a potential outlier and whether or not you want to include that um, as part of your data. Most of the time you always include the outliers as part of your data unless there's some major reason that you shouldn't and then you would always explain why. So we're looking at the patterns we're doing socks again. So your shape, your outliers, your center, and their spread. And then we always want to calculate the numerical summary. So what else do we have to add to that? All right, what we're going to do is we're going to, in the past we just looked at histograms, we're going to sometimes the overall pattern of large numbers of observations is so regular that we can describe it by a smooth curve. So rather than just having a histogram that's sort of broken up, we're going to take a look at what it looks like if I could draw a curve on top of it, a nice smooth curve, and sort of shade it in. That is going to be called a density curve. What a density curve is, is it's basically like taking your histogram, okay, this histogram here, drawing a nice curve on top of it, and sort of filling in the area, like coloring it in, and it's taking a look at all the area underneath the curve. All right, now number one, a density curve is always describes positive data, so it's always above the horizontal axis, okay? Underneath your density curve, it always has an area of one. The reason it has an area of one is it because it represents a 100% of your data is underneath this density curve, okay? And also when you take a look at it, um, make sure that this line right here always stays above the horizontal axis, okay? So it's never going to cross over underneath. It's always going to sort of hover right above that. So it describes the overall pattern of the distribution. The area under the curve and above any interval of values is a proportion of observations that fall within that interval. Now since this is a nice smooth curve, keep in mind, you will never just be looking at single data points under the curve. You're always going to be looking at intervals of values. So for example, what is the percentage of people that have a vocabulary score between two and four? All right, so this graph over here um, gives us what the overall pattern of the histogram of the scores of 947 seventh grade students in Gary and Gary, Indiana, on the vocabulary portion of the Iowa test. The question is, do you remember taking the Iowa test? I remember getting the scores, but I don't remember what the test was. So it's described by a smooth curve drawn on top of your histogram bars. Now, since this curve represents an area, we, like I said, we can't ever find like what's the um, percentage that just have a score of four. Well, remember area has to have a length and width, if we just have a score of four, that's basically just the height. Okay, so height and width, just height doesn't really help us. Okay, so here's what you need to know. Number one, 
what our density curve does is it gives us a good description of the overall pattern of the data. So notice this is a little bit outside the density curve, but notice how we have some little spaces right here that we could kind of fill in. Okay. It when we're talking about density curves, outliers are not usually described by the density curve. Okay, so if an, you have an outlier way over here, that's usually not part of the pattern unless we specifically state there's an outlier. Now, it's always an approximation because no density curve is going to be perfect. There's never going to be a perfect way that I can represent the area perfectly under the curve. They're always an approximation. Like I said right here, see these guys that stick out? You can kind of fill them in over here, but it might not be exact. Most of the time what we're going to be use is we're going to use the normal family of bell-shaped distributions to describe our distribution. However, there are a variety of shapes, so it doesn't always have to look like a beautiful bell curve. You, it can take on different shapes. Now, the area under the curve, like I said before, always has a length and a width, so length and width. In order to find the area under this curve, because if this represents 100% of our data, we can find a percent or an area of the one, you have to have a range of values. If you just find the area at one value, so the area at 10, not going to work because there's no width. Okay, so if we take a look, the shaded area under the curve right here, okay, is about 30% or 0.3. And that's basically like saying if this is 100% of the curve, if I was going to kind of divide this in the middle, this just gives us an estimate that this is about 30% of the curve. Okay. All right, so now in the past, um, we talked about mean versus median in your histogram. We're also going to discuss where the mean and median lie in relation to a density curve. So basically, we're just taking our histograms that we've discussed in the past, making a nice curve over them, and making them look like your bell curve. So with a median, what that means is there's equal areas of mass on either side of the median. So in this case, this is symmetrical. The median's in the middle. There's equal amounts on either side. Here, our median is towards the left hand side because this is right skewed. There's equal amounts of data on this side and equal amounts of data on this side. Same thing with your median here. Okay, you have equal amounts of data to the left and equal amounts of data to, sorry, equal amounts of data to the right and equal amounts of data to the left. Sometimes I get my left and right confused. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> So remember, you want to think of the mean as the balancing point on the curve of, as if it were a solid mass. So if the curve is skewed, the mean is not resistant to outliers, okay? So it's going to change. So for example, in this case, we have all these high values. That mean is not going to be in the same place as the median. It's going to be pulled towards the higher values. It's like a balancing act. We want to put it on a place where the um, on both sides, it's going to be able to balance it without tipping sort of over in one direction or the other, okay? All right, so how do we know where the mean and median are located? This is the exact same concept that we talked about in the past, all right? So we talked about if it's symmetric, the mean and median are about the same. There's equal amounts of data on both sides. You can use both measures of center. However, sort of get used to using the mean because that's what we're going to use along with the standard deviation. If it's skewed to the left, so you have um, some low-lying values, the mean is pulled down by those low-lying values. So therefore, the mean is less than the median. Left skewed mean is less. Okay, um, And we're going to use the median as the measure of center because that gives us a better idea of where the middle of the data is. If it's right skewed, that means we have some high values up here, long right tail. The mean is going to be pulled up by those higher values. We say the, the mean is might, it's mighty, so it's got, um, it's a little bit higher than the median. Um, and we're still going to use the median as the measure of center because it's going to give us a better idea of where most of the data lies. Okay. Honestly, I would not try to memorize this. This is what I do. Um, I never memorize it. I draw a curve, okay, and then I always put the median where most of the data is, and then I say, where's the tail, and I put the mean towards the tail, and then I say, okay, which one's going to be bigger? Um, in this case, it's going to be the mean. So I don't try to memorize it. I just draw the median where most of the data is and the mean towards the tail, and that'll be able to tell you which is larger or smaller.
Okay. All right. So let's take a look at um, some practice with some density curves. And this one's going to be a little bit different than the ones you've seen before. So many random number generators allow users to specify the range of the random numbers to be produced. So on your calculator, you could say between like 0 and 5. All right. Suppose that we specify the outcomes are to be distributed uniformly. Now remember that distributed uniformly means it's basically like creating a rectangle um, or a square because uniformly means all of the bars are exactly the same height, okay? Uniformly between 0 and 2. So I have the same numbers for 0, same numbers for 1, same numbers for 2. I get 0 5 times, 1 5 times, and 2 5 times. Uniform, all exactly the same. The density curve of the outcomes has a constant height between 0 and 2. That's what uniform means. And a height 0 elsewhere. So basically, we're creating a rectangle between 0 and 2. We want to let random variable y be the value generated by the computer. So what I want you to do is take a minute, draw a picture, what you think it's going to look like. What is the density height? What is the height of the density curve between 0 and 2? So just take a minute, draw a graph, and see if you can figure it out. Okay, so you should have gotten 0.5. The reason for that is we're between 0 and 2. Uniform height means I'm going to go up the same distance. I've created a rectangle. Why is it 0 0.5? Well, remember a density curve has to have an area of 1. If we know the width is 0, or sorry, the width is 2, 2 times what number is going to give me 1? So 1 half times 2, we know that this is 2 right here, gives me 1 square unit. Okay. All right, so just get a couple um, practice with these questions. So use your graph from part A and the fact that areas under the curve are proportions of outcomes. You're going to find the proportions of outcomes that are less than 1. Okay, so the probability that it's less than 1, what is that area under that curve? So we know that between 0 and 1, this is 0 times 0 0.5, so that's just going to give us 0.5. Okay, what is the proportion of outcomes that lie between 0.5 and 1.3? Go ahead and try that. Hit pause and then take a look at the answer. Okay, so I draw a picture with these. So between 0.5 and 1.3, I know that that right there has a distance of 1.3 minus 0.5. So how long is that distance? That's 0.8 right there. Okay, what is the height? The height is 0.5, so the width times the height. So 1 half times 0.8 gives me 0.4. All right, so we're going to take a look at normal distributions, but I'm just going to give you a quick introduction. One particularly important class of density curves, so density curves can look like anything, is the normal curves. All right, so we in this class are 99% of the time going to look at normal curves and normal distributions over some of the uniform distributions or the other questions. Okay, what makes a normal curve sort of special? All right, number one, they're all symmetric. That means I should be able to fold them in half and have the same, I should be able to fold it in half and it would look the same on both sides. They're single peaked, so they only have one maximum, and they're bell shaped. They don't have to all be the exact same bell shape, but they are in fact bell shaped. So a specific normal curve is described by looking at the mean and the standard deviation. Okay, so and the reason we're using the mean and standard deviation is because it's symmetric, um, and that is going to give us a better measure of center and spread than the median and the IQR. So these are two different normal curves. They're both nice and bell-shaped. They both have a single peak. Okay, what makes them different? The first graph, the one on the left, this one's a little bit more spread out. So I kind of have data all over the place right here. So that's going to make that standard deviation a little bit bigger because I have more values that are further from the mean. Over here, this one's nice and tall. That means most of the values are clustered around that mean. Therefore, it's going to have a small standard deviation because most of the values are going to be very close from the mean. They're not going to differ. The average distance from the mean is going to be pretty small. Okay. All right, so just a couple of things about the normal curve. Number one, the mean is located at the center of the data. You can change the mean, but not the standard deviation, and the curve will move along the horizontal axis without changing the spread. Basically, what that means is if I add 5 to the mean, it's just going to take this whole graph and move it down 5, and the spread's going to stay exactly the same. It's just like if you had a piece of paper moving it back and forth, okay, it's going to change on the number line, but it's not actually going to change the 
spread. The points on either side, hopefully you've heard about this in calc potentially, are called the inflection points. So where I go from concave down to concave up are inflection points. This is where we're one standard deviation away from the mean. Okay, remember that these are the properties of um, normal curves only. They're specific to normal curves.